going on, everybody? Hey, Daddy I'm trying to start the show, but I can't find Ziggy. You guys see him anywhere? This guy's always late. You see him? Yeah. Can you point him out to me? Over here? No. I don't see him behind here. Behind me? I don't see him behind me. Oh, Ziggy, what's up, man? What's going on? You ready to start the show? Yeah, Ziggy's ready. All right, so let's go. <laughs> Today, I'm here to see a very good friend of mine, Mark Marone, at his pet store, Parrots of the World. This is one of my favorite pet stores on Long Island. It has a lot of nice animals in there, and I can't wait to show you guys around. Come on. All right, guys, so there's a good friend I was talking about outside, Mark Marone. Mark, can you tell us a little, a bit about yourself and what you have going on here and this beautiful place that you put together? About myself. Well, when they made me, they broke the mold. <laughs> so when I was, I was born in 1960. Okay. You could do anything you wanted in those days. All right. All right. 25 cents went a long way. Uh -huh. And I had a passion for the natural world. Okay. So when I was two years old, I would climb the fence into the Bronx Zoo mm -hmm. and they had to call the police to get me out. I didn't I, know that, I never knew that. I would catch crickets and keep them in jars on the porch. I was a constant problem to my parents because I wanted to learn everything there is to know about the natural world. Okay. I wanted to know what every bird did, what every bug did, what every rock did, clouds, everything. Right. Fortunately, times being what they were, you could make money back then. And when I was graduated high school in 1978, I had $5,000 that I got from buying and selling and raising animals. And I opened up a pet shop, which is what I wanted to do. And I've been doing what I want to do ever since. That sounds great, that sounds great. A lot, uh, something you guys really don't know is I used to watch Mark Maroon's show when I was a kid. He's one of the reasons why I actually do this today. So honestly, it's actually a privilege and an honor to be talking to him, interviewing him right now on my show years later. Well, that was interesting how I fell into TV. I never wanted to be on TV. TV sucks. The, uh, I mean, look at Martha Stewart. I worked for her for years. She's a master teacher. Okay. She could teach anybody anything. Mm. But TV don't want her anymore unless she's on with Snoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> so TV's changed. But back in the days, 20 years ago when I started it, you know, I got a, a phone call from Cablevision and they wanted me to do a question and answer show about pets. Mm. So I said, all right. So I went there and I filled out the forms. And they said, we don't want you to do it. We'd rather have a vet do it. All right, it takes a lot to hurt my feelings. So anyway, they called me up two days later. They said the vet didn't want to take the drug test. Okay. <laughs> so if I took the drug test, I could have the job. And I did. One thing led to the next, led to the next. It just goes to show you that life is a bunch of opportunities yeah. you got to take advantage of. Take advantage. Luck brings you the opportunities. Hard work and smarts gives you the ability to take the opportunities and build on it. Hey, that's, that's really wise. I really appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, so, uh, where are we right now? What area are we in? We're in Rockville Center, New York. This I, is my pet shop. I, this I, is your iguana, and this here is his blow-up doll. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about iguanas, some information about them? Well, iguanas are an interesting animal because they, start, they were, the, they were the, the premier pet lizard years ago. Mm because we couldn't get nothing else. Okay. Iguanas are raised on farms in El Salvador to be eaten. Yeah. And the byproduct of the ones that get eaten are the babies that would be shipped up to the United States. And maybe iguanas are the cutest little thing, but they grow up into monsters, right? When this iguana is full grown, it'll be bigger than you yeah, and yeah, weigh yeah. 35 pounds. Yeah. Now they make great pets. You know, when I was a kid, I used to watch the Munsters. They had Spot the Dragon, so I wanted a dragon. The closest thing I get was an iguana, and I had a great big iguana named Puff. Okay. And he was so smart, I taught him to go to the bathroom on newspapers in the corner. He was a really great pet, but it's not a great pet for everybody. So a lot of people buy baby iguanas, and when they grow up, they dump them. Yeah. And they usually dump them on me, and I don't need any more pets. <laughs> so that's why in New York City and a lot of places, iguanas are not legal, yeah. and they took over Florida. Okay, in Florida, you know, there's no stray cats running around. It's iguanas knocking at your door. Yeah. 
But they are very nice pets, and, and they can, they're one of the few reptiles that have a sense of self. They're called sentient. Okay. Because they got a three-chambered heart, they're not too fast. Mm. But if they had a four-chambered heart and were warm-blooded, they'd probably have a dinosaur on your hands. Yeah, he's almost a dinosaur now. <laughs> so, Mark, what's your favorite animal? What's your favorite pet? That all depends on the moment. In this moment right now, what's In this moment pet? right now, I like reptiles. Reptiles. Because you see, when you get old, uh. all right, you want to have stuff that's easy. But when you're young, you, wanna, you go out of your way to make your life complicated. And dogs are probably the most complicated pet. A dog is nice because it'll take a bullet for you. Yeah, yeah. But the only problem with dogs, in my opinion, is that they don't act that way on their own. Okay. We've selectively bred dogs to take bullets for us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I prefer animals that are the way they are. Sort of like having a dysfunctional family. You got your, your uncle who's a thief, and your brother who's a this, and this who's a gambler, and whatever. But you gotta, you gotta accept them as they are. And I grew up in a family like that, so that's why I'm so good with animals, because whatever faults they have, I can see past that yeah. and just accept the good part. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, you wanna take us around, show us around what you have going on in the Well, store? let me sh turn around, and you can see what gets me in trouble all the time. Those are baby parrots. Those baby parrots have no feathers on. So every single day some do-gooders come in, they see the baby parrots, and instead of looking at me and say, how come those birds got no feathers? They pull out their smartphones and they tape it and they say, those birds are diseased, he's got them out for sale. And they post it on Facebook or whatever. And there was a time that bothered me, but it don't bother me anymore. I like it because it's a good condition, it's a good parallel or example of the human condition. People don't talk like we're talking anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody hides in the anonymity of the internet. the internet. Time was that the rejects of society, we kept them buried. We didn't want to hear them because they had nothing important to say. Yeah, yeah. But the anonymity of the internet allows the rejects to, have to act, to, to have a voice. And on the internet, these rejects of society, there's 10% of knuckleheads in any group. Mm. Group of dogs, group of people, but 10% are always knuckleheads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem is that the internet allows these people to mimic normal people, but they have a very loud voice on the yeah, internet, yeah, yeah. and everybody tends to listen to the loudest voice. Yeah. So those baby birds are always getting me into trouble, and I love it. I love it when the, they... they yeah, I love when they send me angry letters. I have... Some, I used to keep a little owl here, uh. and he lived loose in the store, and he lived on top of a shelf. Mm. And when he died of old age, a friend of mine went to Party World across the street, and for three dollars bought me a little toy owl, which lives on the shelf. Okay. And I still get nasty emails from people because they want to know why that poor owl on the shelf has no food or water. And I don't even answer That's these. That's actually really funny. Yeah, I don't answer these people because these, you know, at, at that point, there's nothing you can do for them. At that point, there's nothing you can do for them. See, when we were kids, the bullies took care of them. Now there's no more bullying, so. <laughs> they're, they're the bullies now. Yeah, they're the bullies they're the now. Bullies. They're the bullies on Facebook. They're the bullies on virtual media. So obviously, I have no virtual. I have no contact with virtual media. I'm probably the only person on planet our Earth who doesn't have a smartphone. I didn't have a cell phone. You want to talk to me? You got to call me up. See, look, there's a cord here. <laughs> this is one of the funniest interviews I've ever done. This is actually funny. Oh, you were asking something. I got a good twist on it. I got a good twist on anything. <laughs> there's nothing better than the original phone. I actually respect. I respect the phone. I actually really respect that phone with the cord. Because people are calling and talking yeah. to each other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you gotta, you, you, without that, that, that con that's what happens with the world, without that contact. That's why the world is terrible, because we don't have that contact anymore. And it's sad, but that's just how it is. These birds are Chinese pheasants. They're the cheapest birds on planet Earth. They're like 50 or $60 each. However, people look at them, and they think it's some kind of bird of paradise. But, ever since President Trump came onto the scene, everybody looks at this one with the yellow hair, and says that's the President Trump pheasant. So as far as I'm concerned, it's not the golden pheasant anymore. That's the President Trump pheasant. Now, a lot of do-gooders come in, they look at all the parrots that we sell here, and they say, oh, you go to the rainforest and take these birds out of the rainforest. That's if they talk to me to my face, I explain, no, we breed these birds here. They start off as eggs, and they grow up. Here, let me show you an egg. 
This is a macaw egg. I just took it right out of the incubator. When this egg hatches, it's a little baby like the ones you see under the lights, and then it grows up into one of the big ones you have here. I've actually never seen that before. Rockville Center, New it. York produced parrots. <laughs> So the problem, the sad thing is, a lot of the do-gooders, or causes as we call them, they don't like to hear that. They just run away. They don't want to hear an answer like that. But that's the way it is. Man has subjugated animals since the beginning of time. Every animal that people keep is subjugated in one form or another. Even the most ardent vegetarian who won't eat meat usually has a cat. That cat's got to eat cat food. Chickens had to be killed to be put into that can of cat food. So you have to realize that life is all a matter of balance. You, know, you can't have a balance one way or the other. And we subjugate animals, whatever we have to do. Dogs get castrated. Cats get neutered. Horses have bridles. You can't sugarcoat it. Even wild animals are managed now. All right? There's game biology to determine how many animals go into every one. And the interesting thing is, we would not be here if it wasn't for the subjugation of animals. If the first man didn't take a wolf and make it a pet, that man would not have been as good a hunter and we would never have evolved to what we were here. If a person many years ago didn't see a baby horse and make it into a pet, they wouldn't have traveled. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to use horses. So we, man first kept pets. Man had no idea you could use a wolf to hunt with. He had no idea you could... How are you going to look at a horse and think you could ride it? All right, that came later. First came about keeping a horse as a pet. Now, here's the interesting part. You and I, and the, most of the people here, like animals. We like to keep them as pets. We like sharing our lives with pets, but not everybody's like that. So 25,000 years ago, there was a group of cavemen and Fred, this one particular Fred Flintstone looked at a wolf and didn't think of it as something to be eaten. He just liked having it around. He was the first pet keeper. But if it wasn't for the first pet keepers, other people wouldn't have been able to use the animals and we would have no technology or civilization. So it was people like us that actually changed the world and made it into what it is today, good or bad. That's a very interesting... Uh you know, breakdown. Yeah, you're not going to find that in any book. <laughs> or you're only going to find way. this on your <laughs> show. People get to watch your show and I, learn things about human nature that yes. they wouldn't see anywhere. Really see, people think it. I know about animals, but I know more about people than animals. Because it was man's uh, desire to learn about animals, man's desire to keep animals, to live with animals, that created the world that we have today. Mm. Because without the subjugation of animals, we'd be living in caves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark is actually kicking me out now, man. He's a busy guy. He's a superstar. Hey, I give you more than I give anybody else. <laughs> now, snakes are an animal that I, I've always been fascinated by snakes, ever mm. since I was a little kid. And snakes are an animal that's vilified by people. I don't really understand why. Yes, there's some poisonous snakes, but dogs do a lot of damage too. Dogs put people in hospitals every day. Mosquitoes kill thousands and thousands of people. Mm. Snake, some snakes are bad, but not all of them. What kind of snake is this? This is a Dumeril's boa. A what boa? A Dumeril's boa. A Dumeril's boa. And if you want a snake that, you know, as a, as a pet, they don't shed. Everybody's kids are allergic to something these days, but nobody's ever alerted to a snake. You know, and if it wasn't for a snake talking to Eve and to eat the apple, we'd still be walking around naked in the Garden of Eden. That is true. So you said he doesn't, uh, doesn't shed? No, they, I mean, they don't shed fur. Okay, so there's nothing to be allergic to. If you want to go away on vacation, leave the snake in the cage, you can care less if you were dead or alive. It's not going to be sad if you're gone. So as far as I'm concerned, I mean, snakes are the perfect millennial pet. See that? I just started a new trend. This yeah. Right <laughs> Everybody's going to do this now. So how old is this snake? That's about uh, six months old. And uh, are you able to tell the sex of the snake? Yes, you know, you can tell the sex of the snake by the length of the tail. Oh, a female, okay. now looks, a snake looks like it's all tail, but it's not. See, the snake's tail yeah. starts right there. So when they have a short tail, it's a female. When they got a long tail, it's a male. Right, I never knew that. See, people watch your show to learn things they can't find anywhere else. I'm actually learning on my own show. <laughs> well, you got to learn something new every day. That's my motto. I got to learn something new every day. Did you name this snake yet? 
If it's a male snake, it's Adam. If it's a female snake, it's Eve. Snakes got no ears, no eyelids, no arms, no legs, and only one lung. So they're pretty compromised. You can call a snake anything you want. He can care less. He can't even hear you. He's got no ears. So, so that's, a, that's a female snake. So its name is Eve. I guess if you wanted the HD uh, edition, you could call it Eden. Eden. So if snakes can't hear, uh, how do they make up for it? They, they make up for it by their tongue. Okay, the they tongue. stick the tongue out and they can, they can smell everything on the tongue. Now, we can't even begin to understand what a snake can learn by its sense of taste. That'd be like describing the color red to a blind man. But snakes learn everything by their tongue because they pick up everything and they learn everything. That's very interesting. I really like the snake. I think it likes me. How do you know it likes you? Well, maybe it doesn't. It's right. It it's sort of like it's me. sort of like a doll. You just make believe. <laughs> it could actually be trying to eat me. Right you make now. believe that it talks, just I like you make believe a doll talks. I think it hugs, it's hugging you. It's oh, it's hugging you. It's in love with you. Look at that. It's a female snake too. She likes the dreadlocks. Uh, I'm gonna take this one. All right. Ah, that's good. Look at now remember how I said iguanas are not the right kind of pet for everybody? A bearded dragon is the right kind of pet for everybody. They're just as smart as, well, they're not as smart as iguanas. Iguanas are smarter than dragons, but they can still recognize people. They don't shed fur. You can go away for a weekend and leave it by itself. But most importantly, they don't get much bigger than here to here. So it's not going to outgrow your house the way an iguana does. So for kids that are allergic to dogs and cats, or for a busy family that doesn't have time, then the breed of dragon is the pet of the, of the present and the pet of the future. So what's the personality of a bearded dragon? They're very, very friendly. They recognize people, but they're not as smart as an iguana. Iguana is definitely more aware than a dragon. Okay. But it's smart enough. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that smart. It's like you see these movies about robots, you know, they make them smarter and smarter and smarter until they take over. They don't have to have robots that smart. They just need to be smart enough to wax your car. All right, All right so where will we find a bearded dragon on a typical day? Every pet shop sells bearded dragons. Of course, I myself sell the best bearded dragons. But bearded dragons are sold all over the world, literally. And it's funny because 30 years ago, nobody had bearded dragons at all. Then uh, the first ones were imported from Australia into Germany. They went from Germany to the United States and everybody started breeding them and we're do we've domesticated them. The bearded dragons that we keep as pets do not act or look like the native ones that are in Australia. Okay. They're totally different. So if someone was to come and buy one of the best reptile pets that they can buy, how would they set them up? What would be the care? Between the tank and the heater and the tank to keep the crickets and that's the only drama with the bearded dragons. You gotta come in every week and buy crickets to feed them. Okay. Fortunately, crickets come in neat little boxes now. Pretty soon they'll come in vending machines. That'd be a good business, actually. So if you bought a baby bearded dragon like that, with all the fixings, it would cost about two hundred and fifty dollars, which is a lot of money, you might think. But it's all upfront money. Afterwards, all you gotta buy is the crickets. So I hope you enjoyed the show. We learned a lot about animals, but something I didn't even expect. We learned a lot about people and how animals help societies evolve. Without animals, without people keeping animals, society and the world wouldn't be what it is today. And it's very interesting, and uh. This is my new friend on the name Rex, right on the show. His name is Rex. Rex, that'll work. <laughs> Alright, say bye, Rex. You can't even see him. Alright, Mark, thanks. Well, you got something that nobody else on planet Earth has right now. You got I me. I know. I know. <laughs>